Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Moore. Um, today is Saturday, April the 25th, and this will be a Sunday sermon. And we are doing a study in the book of 1 Peter on uh, conquering through Christ and uh, how to continue in suffering. I think last week uh, I said surviving the storm. So we've been just looking at some ways uh, that Peter encouraged uh, those believers he wrote to to continue in their faith. And so I want to continue that today and uh, continue looking in 1 Peter. So that's what we're going to do. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're uh, staying safe and healthy and uh Hope that you haven't gotten this virus and just hope your family's doing okay. And it does appear that uh, we'll probably be able to go back to church soon, which would be uh, great. And uh, that's exciting news. So hopefully that'll work out and we'll, I won't have to do these uh, meetings in my kitchen, uh, which would be uh, a blessing for Tammy. Uh, she, she wouldn't have to go through all of this uh, rigmarole to get these things uh video. But anyway, I hope you're doing well, and I hope you'll enjoy today's message. Um, so we're going to talk about, again, uh, we're talking about our salvation. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Peter is kind of praising our, our uh, great salvation for its benefits. And uh, we talked about uh, that for several weeks and uh, when we started the study. But anyway, um, Peter just reminds the believers of their great resources they have in Christ. And uh, we talked about they, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, they have this uh, lively hope. So they have a living hope because of the resurrection. And we have this uh, lovely inheritance. Uh, that's our life in heaven and, and heaven itself. And of course, God and Christ in heaven. And then we have this uh, lasting helper we talked about in verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith. So uh, God keeps our faith. It's not up to us. Praise the Lord. If it was up to us, though, we wouldn't be able to keep it. Uh, we'd lose it somehow. Uh, but the Lord is the one who guards our faith, preserves it, takes care of it, keeps it. And so, uh, anyway, Peter's just uh, reminding them of these re great resources and benefits they have in their faith. And we talked about that. Then we talked about responding uh, to trials um, in our faith. And we talked about responding with joy. And we talked about that uh, last week a little bit. Um, and then we also talked uh, maybe briefly a little bit about the, uh, the reward of our salvation, which is in verse number 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So the, the great reward of our salvation is one day it'll all be consummated and completed and we will uh, be together with the Lord in heaven. So, so anyway, those first nine verses, it, it seems to be that Peter is just reminding them of some great benefits and blessings and their response to trials <clears throat> to keep believing in spite of their suffering. And so the difficult thing in our life is to keep believing in spite of our circumstance. It reminds me of the story of Joseph. Joseph, uh, you know, had those dreams that, that he was going to be, uh, you know, in a sense great, that people were going to bow down to him. And, and then yet his life went exactly the opposite way. Instead of him going up, which would have probably been what he was thinking in his mind, he went down. He ended up in prison, you know, uh, was thrown in the pit before prison and all that stuff. So Joseph's life was... Uh, it had to be difficult for him to comprehend how all of that was going to work out for him. And, uh, and for us on our salvation, <clears throat> our salvation experience, it is difficult for us sometimes to look at our circumstances and our situation and kind of reconcile that with how, how and what God is doing in our lives. And so Peter, I think, is just tr trying to remind those believers, don't give up on your faith. And uh, in spite of, of what you see around you and in spite of what's going on, uh, keep believing. And that's what, you know, uh, he's talking about in verse number six. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. So I think Peter's underlying thought here 
really through all of chapter one, is just to keep believing. And uh, so he gives these, uh, he gives this kind of a, a, a uh, kind of a praise of our salvation of these great benefits and resources we have to deal with life. And then in verse number 10, he, he kind of makes a transition and instead of praising our salvation, he seems to be promoting our salvation for its greatness. In the, in the first nine verses, maybe he was praising it for its benefits, but in, in verses 10 through 13, he seems to be promoting it in one sense for its greatness. And uh, he, is, uh, he seems to be um, evaluating the salvation from a look at the past, if you will, and that may not be the best way to, to say that, but he's looking, at, he's looking at our salvation from the past, and he's just saying, you know what? It is a great salvation. So let me read you these verses, and I'm going to dive into that uh, kind of quickly. He says in verse 10, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, or therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So in verses 1 through 9, as Peter is praising uh, our salvation for its great benefits, and he ends with this thought, verse number 9, receiving the end of your faith, uh, even your, the salvation of your souls. Then he transitions into the greatness of our salvation. And I want to read to you what Philip says in his commentary about about salvation in a sense. He says, the Bible is the book in which salvation's truth has been revealed. The purpose of the Bible is not to teach us things that we can otherwise discover for ourselves. Our reasoning powers can do that. The Bible's not a handbook of history, although it contains a great deal of history. And the history it does record is unerringly accurate. It's not a textbook of science, although it speaks to many scientific themes. Its astronomy, meteorology, physics, and medicines, medicine are totally inerrant. It is not a treatise on legislation, although it contains a thoroughly comprehensive legal code that is, no sublime, that is so sublime as to be the foundation of all modern Western civilized codes. It's not a book about psychology, although it speaks with authority in all matter of human behavior. Behavior. The Bible's a book about salvation. It goes beyond the reach and scope of human reasoning. It tells us the truth can be, that can be known only by revelation. It tells us that we need to it tells us that we need to know about salvation. We learn from the Bible something quite foreign to the world's religions all of which are based on human reasoning. Uniformly, the world's religions teach us that salvation is by works, that it has to be earned, that it's based on human merit, sacrifice, perseverance, and effort. The Bible, however, teaches that it's by faith, not by works. Thus, Peter speaks of the end of your faith, the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Man says do, God says done. Man says try, God says trust. We're receiving this salvation. The present participle used in verse 9 here shows that it's an ongoing process. All of the time we are receiving the end result of our faith in Christ, the salvation of our souls. Isn't that great? So as Peter's talking about this salvation, all right, he is, he is appraising it in verses 1 through 9, but he's promoting it in verses 10 through 13. And really, I'm just going to cut to the chase here, right? He's, he's not only promoting it, he's defending it. And he's not just defending it, he's recommending it. What he is doing is he's building up the salvation for those, for those readers to read about that salvation and to embrace that salvation. 
not to give up on that salvation, not to turn away from that salvation. Peter's driving force here, he's using verses 10 through 13 really as an illustration of the relevance and the reality and the validity and the authority of salvation itself. And he, and he gives that illustration to prove its validity, if you will, its reality, its relevance, its importance to humanity. He, uses, he gives an illustration by using a couple of different pictures. One of them is the prophets from the Old Testament. They preached it. It's been God's plan from eternity past. From the beginning of the world, the uh, preachers that God selected in the Old Testament have been preaching this same message. It is God's plan of salvation from eternity, if you want to say it that way. And so as Peter is recommending the salva this salvation, he's just saying, don't forget, this has been God's plan from, from the beginning of, of our time. It has never changed one bit. Uh, the promises, the, the purposes, the plans, the provision, the principles, all of the things surrounding God's salvation, it's never changed. Um, listen to just a few of these verses. This is Jude, verse 14. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand, ten thousands of his saints. Enoch preached of the Lord. He's the seventh, it says, from Adam. From the beginning of time, our time, it has been preached of this plan of salvation. Um, it goes on to say uh, in Acts chapter 3, listen to this, verse 21, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, since the world began. Acts 3.21, Since the world began, the prophets have been preaching this great message of salvation to humanity. And, uh, and it never has changed. And it's not going to change. It's not going to be edited. It's not going to be revised. It's, uh, it's not going to be uh, amended in any way. The plan of salvation is certain, it is settled, it is sure, and these Old Testament prophets, they preached it. And so one, one thing that Peter is just trying uh, to help them understand is this salvation that is being preached to you, that you are to, to embrace and to follow, it is something that has been around since the beginning of time, and it's from God. It is from, well, look in verse number... Uh, Oh, number 11, it says, Searching water, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did, did signify when it testified before Him the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. The Spirit of Christ was in them, inspiring them to preach that message. But it goes on to say, Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us that did they minister the things which are now reported unto you by them, that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. This message came from God, from heaven, for humanity, and it came, it, it was, it was uh, planned before the beginning of our time, but it's been preached since the beginning of our time. It is the message, really, the plan from eternity. Titus 1 verse 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised, before the world began. 2 Timothy 1.9 Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, listen, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now that may not be a big deal to you, but part of what, what Peter is trying to remind that believer of is this. Listen, this is a plan that's been established and settled and certain and has been preached over and over and over because it is God's exclusive plan for mankind. So it's God's plan from eternity, if you will. And, uh, and again, it's not going to change. Aren't you glad? Malachi chapter 3, I think it is verse 6, God cannot change, and He's not going to change. He's not going to change His plan. He's not going to come you know, to the, the end of your life, and all of a sudden there's some kind of a, 
an amendment to God's plan. Uh, the second thought is this, not only is, uh, is it God's plan from eternity, but God had selected His own special person from eternity. Listen to what 1 Peter 1.20 says. Speaking of Christ, who was verily foreordained, listen, who was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Did you know that not only the plan was created, if you will, but the person was selected? Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, was chosen to be that Messiah that would carry out or fulfill that plan. That, has, that was chosen before the world began. It says even, again, 1 Peter, uh, He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. And not only this plan from eternity and this person from eternity, Jesus Christ, but a people was chosen before uh, uh, or before time and from eternity. Ephesians 1 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We, the church, the body of Christ was chosen to be that people group, if you will, that he called out of this world to represent him. That was, We were chosen before the foundation of the world. And so anyway, as you consider verse number 10, when he talks about uh, this, these prophets uh, of the Old Testament, how they searched and they inquired diligently and who prophesied of the grace, it's just a reminder that this is God's plan from eternity. But it's not just God's plan and His person and His people from eternity that have been chosen. Again, as Peter is trying to remind them uh, to embrace that, but it's also a plan that, that was a mystery. So it says in verse number 10, they searched and they inquired diligently. Verse 11, they searched what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified before, before him the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So not only was the, the God's plan from eternity, but God's plan is a mystery. And the Old Testament prophets, when they preached it, they didn't quite understand it. They were perplexed. I liked what I like what um, uh, J. Vernon McGee says about that, and I'm going to read it to you. He says, uh, there are many places in the Old Testament that speak of the sufferings of Christ, and there are many places that speak of the sovereignty of Christ and of the kingdom age. Grace and glory are combined, and it was difficult for them to understand this. They didn't get it. They were perplexed, confused, confounded, if you will. For example, he says, Isaiah wrote in the 53rd chapter of the sufferings of Christ. But then in the 11th chapter of Isaiah, he wrote of the Messiah coming in power and in glory to the earth to establish his kingdom. This seeming contradiction was very puzzling to the prophets, and they tried to find out how both of these things could be true. As the prophets looked down the corridors of time, they saw these two events as two great mountain peaks, but they couldn't see the valley of time between them. And so the interesting thing is the Old Testament, now stay with me, the Old Testament prophets, they were perplexed. It was a mystery to them. Uh, matter of fact, the, in the Bible speaks of this mystery. Um, Romans 16, 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. This mystery, the, the, the Old Testament prophets couldn't understand how there was a suffering and a sovereign Savior. They didn't, they didn't understand that. They couldn't reconcile it. Matter of fact, in, uh, Philip, in Philip's uh, commentary here, he says, uh, he says this on page, where is it, next page. He says, some Jewish commentators postulated there were two messiahs. One to be a suffering Messiah and the other to be a sovereign Messiah. So it's interesting that the, the Old Testament prophets, although it was the plan from eternity, it was a plan that was shrouded in mystery. Now stay with me. 
Peter is illustrating salvation to the believer. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, you know, this is God's plan, and this is God's perfect plan, and it's His powerful plan, and He's provided for this plan, and has all these promises and principles, but it's a plan that is that has a mystery with it. Now, I understand that this passage, it's speaking of this mystery has been revealed in Christ, but I want to I apply it in a little different way and just tell you that there's some mystery in our salvation. And part of that mystery is this, how, how and why, why do we have to go through suffering to get where God wants us to go? Why do we have to go through trial and trouble and temptation and struggle to become what God wants us to be? I understand there are answers to, to that in a sense, but I'm telling you, there's some things in our Christian life that are puzzling. And Peter's underlying thought, I believe, as I, I've meditated on this for the last few days, I really believe Peter's saying this, these prophets continued to believe the mysterious plan of God's salvation even though they couldn't grasp all of it. They couldn't get it. They didn't understand it. They didn't see it. They didn't know it. But they kept believing it in spite of not being able to reconcile all of it. In spite of not being able to figure it all out and to say, you know, I understand all of it. And I want to tell you, even, and it goes down, it goes on to say here in verse number uh, 12, it says that, that, which these things are now reported unto you by, by them that have preached the gospel. They were, there were those preaching the gospel and getting other people saved, and those preachers didn't even understand all of it. They didn't get all of it. None of us get all of it. But part of what part of what Peter's trying to get across to them is in spite of this great mystery that was in the Old Testament, and I know it's been revealed now in Christ in the New Testament, but in spite of the suffering and the glory, the mystery that is surrounded uh, in uh, that surrounds salvation, they kept believing. They kept studying. They kept inquiring to try to find out those answers. They kept following. And I'm telling you, I really believe part of what Peter is trying to say here, he's not just defending the faith by saying, you know, those prophets preached it from, from the, the beginning of the world, but he's recommending the faith, saying, listen, they believed it in spite of understanding it. The angels, it says, it says in verse number... Uh, 12, which things the angels desire to look into. The angels desire to have a, a greater understanding of it. And yet, here's what Peter wants us to say. He wants you to keep believing, even though it is a great mystery. They couldn't see it. They didn't understand the suffering and the glory and how those could be reconciled. So it's a great mystery. And it's not just God's plan from eternity it's not just God's plan that has a, a mystery, but it is God's plan for you personally. And that's where we come to verse number 13. He says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end. Now, why in the world would Peter say that? Why would he say, Therefore, because of this great salvation that, that was shrouded in mystery, and that was searched and diligently inquired of by the prophets and even the angels. He says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. And you know the word gird there just means it was the picture of those uh, in the Roman times when they would pick up the, their skirts and tuck them into their belt so they wouldn't be hindered or, or hampered so they could move quickly. And I really think the thought here is this, guys and ladies, and there's three quick thoughts here in verse number 13. Peter's recommending to those believers to gird up the loins of your mind. He's just saying this, be strong in your mind. Your mind is going to be assaulted and attacked and ambushed, not only by the devil, but by doubts and by all kinds of uh, skepticism and all kinds of uh, concern and all kinds of confusion. 
Why is God allowing me to go through this? Why did this happen to me? Why is my family struggling this? Why doesn't my life turn out like I want it to be? Why doesn't God get me out of this mess? Why doesn't God do this? Or why is God allowing that? All of those things that confuse us and confound us, Peter is saying this, gird up the loins of your mind. Be strong in your mind. Don't let your mind collapse on you under the weight of the puzzle that your life presents for you. We don't know. We don't know what God's doing all the time. But we do know this, God has this great plan and He's working it out from, from the beginning of the world. He's not going to change it. He has these tremendous principles to help us, but He just wants you to believe it. Be strong. Don't be, it, it has the idea, really, the word uh, gird up the loins of your mind, it has the idea, be prepared, be ready for the assault so you are not um, overcome, you're not defeated. So could I just encourage you? Listen, Peter's illustrating the greatness of our salvation. He's promoting it. He's defending it. He's recommending it because it is the greatest thing we could ever have. It is what God has given us to see us through this world. And he's saying this, don't give up on it. I know you're suffering. I know you're struggling. I know your life is not what you think it, it was going to be. And it's difficult. And sometimes it's disappointing. But I'm telling you, even though we look at life like that, and we don't understand life like that, we need to be strong in our mind and not give up on God. So I want to encourage you, be strong. The second thing he says is this, gird up the loins of your mind, be strong, and be sober. The word sober there, it has the mean, it, it means this, it means to be steady. It means to be sure, uh, certain. It means to be settled. So, so Peter's recommending to them. Matter of fact, there was one translation I read where he says, Fine, uh, it has the idea of finally settle it in your mind. And the idea here is this. We're going to be strong and we're going to be settled on what we believe. We're to walk by faith, not by sight. I don't. The things that I see sometimes, I can't understand how they work into my faith and how they're working for God. But I do know this, I can be certain that they are working and that God is working and that God's going to work. And the idea here is I'm not just to be strong to not, to not be overcome by those doubts, but I'm to be settled. I'm to be confident. I'm to be sure that God's salvation is real. God's salvation is going to help me. God's salvation is going to see me through this. So be settled in your faith. Don't allow your doubts and your disappointments and your discouragements to lead you to, be, to carry your way. And honestly, the idea of that be sober, it, it has the idea of not being allowed to be carried away or to caught away or to led away or taken away. But you know what? I'm going to be anchored in my faith and even though I may not understand everything, because I don't, even though I may not be able to, to reconcile everything, I can't. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep trusting. So he says, wherefore, gird up the ones of your mind, be sober, and then hope to the end. Hope to the end. You know, so this be strong, be steady, and the last thing is this, be sure, hope to the end. And listen to what he says, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think all of these verses, even from verse 1 to here, all of it is being wrapped around this idea of don't give up on your salvation. One day it is going to be completed. It's going to be consummated in your uh when you see Christ and when you're with Christ finally forever, and he's saying, don't give up on that. That is your hope to the end. That is our faith. He uses that word uh, apocalypsis, which is the revelation here in verse uh, number 13. He says, uh, unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He, he uses that same word over in verse number 7, but he says, um, that we that we might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The word appearing 
and the word of um, the word revelation are the exact same word in the Greek. It's like apocalypsis is mean his appearing or his revelation. But the idea here is that Peter, I think he's tying all of that together and, he, and he's, pra he's praising salvation. He's promoting salvation. But he's really, he's recommending that salvation. Don't give up on it. Now, I know most of you aren't going to throw your faith away. But the fact is, you may be struggling with your faith. You may be questioning your faith. Why is God allowing this to happen? And in those times, you have to be strong in your mind. Don't let those doubts about God's goodness and His greatness towards you uh, take you away. You need to be steady in your mind. Don't be carried away with those, those disappointments and, and those other uh, things that might deceive you into thinking there's another uh, plan, if you will. And to be sure in your mind our hope is in the appearing of Jesus Christ. You know, I've often said, there's nothing good about me. God called me to preach. I, I praise God for that. I don't know why. Uh, sometimes <clears throat> I often say he called me to preach because I'd, I'd show up for church every time the doors were open. But, uh, but I can tell you this. In my heart, I know that one day I'm going to be in the presence of, of God and Christ, the Holy Spirit in heaven. And I know I have their presence now, but one day this will all be consummated. And it's not because I'm good. It's not because of anything I've ever done. It's because of what Christ has done, because his salvation is so great. And all he wants us to do is to place our faith in that. In verse number nine, he says this, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Verse five, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto, the sal unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Could I, just, could I just encourage you? Be strong in your faith. I know we don't understand it. It's a mystery sometimes. Be steady in your faith. Don't allow things to, to take you away from God's plan from eternity. And be sure of your faith. One day it will all come together, it will be consummated and completed, and one day we'll be with Christ in heaven. That's the truth, and that's what Peter wants them to be reminded of. And I want to remind you of that. And, uh, and I hope, again, I hope you're doing well. I hope something said has been a blessing to you. And uh, hopefully we'll be back at church soon. So uh, let's bow together and we'll pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We praise you for your goodness. Bless our time together. Lord, I pray uh, something uh, that's been said will be a help and a blessing. I pray you'd work in hearts and lives and Lord, help us just to, to keep believing, trusting, following in spite of whatever we see around us. In Jesus' name, amen.